Good, good afternoon. When I was in high school, I participated in the sport of track and field, specifically running the 400 meter dash. I remember to this day, the first time I ran the event, my time 59.8 seconds. As I lie there on the ground gasping for air, the thought of running any faster seemed impossible to me. But I was fortunate enough to be able to do just that. By the end of that first sophomore season, bringing my time down to 54 seconds. After a great deal of hard work, brought my time down as a senior even further to 51 seconds, and was fortunate enough to be able to run at the university level, where I was succeeded in running 50 seconds. But try as I might, I was not able to break the 50 second barrier. Did 50 seconds represent a place of perfection for me that I would never be able to reach or surpass? Since I have long been intrigued by the human limits of performance, and specifically with the purest of all sports, track and field, I would like to take a look today at the pursuit of perfection through that venue. Historians tell us, and we'll start with the marathon. Historians tell us, or legend tells us, that in 492 BC, a messenger by the name of Pheidippides was sent from Marathon to go to Athens with news of a military victory over the Persians there. After traversing the roughly 26 mile or so journey between the two cities, Pheidippides arrived in Athens, burst into the Athenian assembly, and exclaimed loudly, we have won, before succumbing to the fatigue of the journey and unfortunately dying on the spot. We have no stopwatches back then, no GPSs, and therefore no ability to know how long it took Pheidippides to make that journey. So to see our first world record, we're gonna have to scroll ahead approximately 2,500 years or so. 1908, the Olympic Marathon in London. Entering the stadium first that day with a sizable lead was an Italian pastry chef by the name of Dorando Pietri. With only several hundred meters to go before the finish line, Mr. Pietri, however, became delirious from the heat, stumbled, fell, and could not get up. When he finally got up, he started running out of the stadium the other direction, on, which unfortunately is against the rules. He was guided to the finish line by the, by the meet officials and awarded the gold medal. But after an American protest, the medal was awarded to this man, Johnny Hayes, the first recognized world record holder. As the 20th century progressed, so too did our knowledge of athletics our interest in records, and certainly our interest in breaking these records. Throughout the 20th century, the marathon record was broken many times, sometimes by increments as small as a few seconds, other times by many minutes. Not only was the development of the science of training influential in the development and progress of these records, but so too was the development of fine points, the conditions needed for people to run faster or to, be get, to get records. Conditions in the marathon, for instance, such as running in the cooler time of the day, or running on courses with few hills and few turns. So let's take a look at the marathon record itself before we can try to see how fast we might be able to run someday. As we can see, several things become apparent. Okay? The world record in the marathon is decreasing as time goes on. In fact, you can see that the record is slowing down, however. Let's take two 15-year periods and analyze it a little more carefully. The first 15-year period, generally a peacetime period before World War II, we see that the world record in the marathon came down only three times, but by a total of nine minutes. Compare that with, over at the end, the last 15-year period of time, and we can see that the record came down a number of times, but in this case only by three minutes, so a definite decrease. The next thing I'd like to look at with you is the notion of punctuated equilibrium. Punctual, an equilibrium obviously referring to a period of time where the record is stagnant and not being broken. If we look here, this area right here, we see a period of about 18 years where the world record was only broken once. That's the World War II period of time, and it's clear and obvious why the record wouldn't have been broken at that time. However, following World War II, we see a, a number of records being broken for a period of about 15 or 20 years, and that was due to several factors. C clearly, the world being at peace was the biggest, but the accessibility of transportation and just the popularity of the sport. Eventually, by 1968, we see a stagnation occurring, a 10-year period or so where the world record remained stagnant and no records were being broken, leading many to come out and say that the world record was doomed and no one was going to run any faster. That was the prevalent mindset. And then we see here a punctuation of that equilibrium, a number of world records being set in the 1980s. What would have brought that punctuation about? Well, several factors, the inception of prize money, the worldwide running boom, and the fact that it was very easy to get on a plane and get to a competition. Again, by 1988, we see another punctuation and a 10-year period or so when those people came back and said, well, see, now the world record is done. Nobody's going to run any faster. 
And yet again, we see another punctuation with a numerous world records set in, the, in recent years. This last punctuation was due to several factors, uh, most notably in the inception of a new gene pool into the equation. Um, from Africa and, the Ken and Kenya in particular, and the second being that race directors and race creators became very savvy and technical at creating specific races where records could take place. Um, and that's where we have it today. So where will the world record in the mile be someday? Hard, I'm sorry, in the marathon, be someday. Hard to tell based on this graph. One cannot simply do a regression and extrapolation out past the year 2015 and determine that the world record might, for instance, be an hour 55 in 20 years. That's preposterous and, and really can't be done. However, there is prominent research being done that indicates that a two-hour marathon is possible, in fact, probable in the near future. This research goes around technical concepts such as VO2 max, which I really don't want to get into today. However, suffice it to say that a two-hour marathon is possible. Let's turn our attention from the longest event in track and field the marathon to the shortest event in track and field, the 100-meter dash. This is Usain Bolt, the fastest man that the world has ever seen, and present world record holder in the 100-meter dash. And let's look at the world record progression in the 100 meters as well. This is what the world record progression looked like before Bolt reached the world scene. You can see a fairly steady decrease in the, time, in the times. And look what happens after Bolt appears. A significant drop. What does this mean about how fast man will be able to run someday? Well, there seems to be a lot of confusion among experts on the topic. There are many skeptics who believe that both certainly must be taking performance-enhancing substances to be able to run that fast, PEDs. However, there has been absolutely no substantiation whatsoever to those claims. What's far more likely is that Bolt seems to have physical attributes unlike any sprinter that the world has ever seen, namely to go along with his size, a very large frame at six feet, five and a half inches. The conventional wisdom among track experts and coaches and those who study the event was always that sprinters needed to be short and powerful to be world record holders in the 100 meter dash. Long leg sprinters such as Bolt tended to be siphoned off and led into other races such as the 400 meters or the 800 meters because it was believed that long legs would be counterproductive to the explosiveness and power needed for short sprints. Bolt certainly seems to have turned this prototype upside down. Now, Bolt may be an extremely unique athlete, but it is also hard to believe that he's going to be the last person ever born on the planet to have those such attributes. This, turn of, this line of thinking has in turn led researchers to theorize and propose and study that when Bolt or a Bolt-like runner actually performs in perfect conditions, meaning perfect altitude, perfect temperature, and perfect wind, that not only is a 9.5 possible, but so could be a 9.4 or even a 9.3. So we've looked at the marathon, and then we've looked at the 100 meters. The last event we'd like to look at in terms of man's progress towards perfection would be the mile, an event familiar to many of us, as many of us have not only run the mile, but a lot of us actually know how fast we ran the mile in. Uh, here is our first recognized world record of the modern era, set by John Paul Jones of the United States in 1914. The mile has a particular allure or mystique to it, unlike other events in track and field. And thus, almost every middle and long distance runner throughout history has put his, in, in the women's case, her attempts out to break the world record in the mile. By 1944, the world record was lowered, 19, 1945, the world record was lowered to 401, a 13 second drop. Here it is being set by Gunter Hogg of Sweden, right at the end of World War II. However, following Hogg's record, the world record in the, in the mile, I'm sorry, stood for nine long years, stagnation. The prevalent mindset during this period of time was not only that the world record in the mile would never be broken, but that a four minute mile was an impossibility, a physical impossibility. There were medical journals and papers posted that said if man tried to run long enough and fast enough in an attempt to run a four minute mile, his body would simply collapse under the strain. Then, at the end of that nine year period, comes an outlier. A dreamer, a young man who was shrugging off the disappointment of the 1952 Olympics after not meddling there as a favorite, a young medical student in training by the name of Roger Bannister. Bannister, using the principles he was learning and trying to become a doctor, was going to incorporate physiological principles into his approach. By running even splits rather than uneven splits, Bannister was going to attempt to conserve the energy needed for the entire race. 
Though many not, did not agree that this was possible, he went out to do so anyway. So on May 6, 1954, at Oxford University, on a cinder track in a very small competition, Bannister set out to do the impossible and break the four-minute mile. By the time Bannister crossed the finish line and the record was announced at 359.4, the crowd erupted into a frenzy, not so much because Bannister had simply broken the record, not simply because a local hero had won, and not even so much that a four-minute mile was broken, but because it seemed as though man's will to defeat the impossible had triumphed. A record that had stood for all of athletic history and nine long years and thought to be unbreakable was broken within a matter of minutes. What's really interesting is that the man that finished second that day, his name is John Landy of Australia, broke Bannister's record just 46 days later, making Bannister one of the shortest tenured record holders of all time. <laughs> but he's certainly not a footnote in history. In all, to see how the floodgates got open that day, since 1954, over 1,300 runners have broken four minutes in the mile, as young as 17 and as old as 41. Here is present world record holder Hisham El Garouj of Morocco, and he has run 343, which is quite faster. So how much faster will the mile record get someday? Well, let's look at that, let's look at that progression. As we can see here, the world record in the mile has been stagnant since Garouj said it almost 15 years. Does that mean the mile record will never be broken? I think we can say now with, with almost certainty that it will be broken someday and that we appear to be in one of those periods of equilibrium waiting for the next punctuation to take place. What might cause that next punctuation in the mile, or for that matter, let's expand this, what might cause the next punctuation or break in world records at any amount? Perhaps as we've seen with Usain Bolt, the appearance of a new body type. Perhaps as we've seen with Roger Bannister, the appearance of a new philosophy or outlook. Perhaps as being done in the marathon, a ways to create races or devise races that are only being run under optimal conditions in an effort to increase the ability or the possibilities of a world record coming that day. Or perhaps world records will come about in some ways we have not seen yet. For instance, perhaps we will be running on artificially created surfaces that haven't been developed yet. Or perhaps athletes will be taking vitamins or some type of performing enhancing substances that either haven't been discovered yet or just haven't been allowed yet. Or going further out on a limb, is our desire to re set records so great that perhaps super athletes will come about, the result of genetic engineering or selective breeding? There are some who say we are not really getting faster, that the world records we're seeing are a smokescreen, the result of technology, of environmental manipulation, and even tinkering with the human body. These people are partially correct. But I would say to you, is not technology the, one of the purposes of technology to help us do things that we could not have done otherwise? Is it not in our DNA to use our creativity to do things that the generation before us was not able to do? So the question becomes, how fast can we run someday? As a metaphor for how good can we can be someday. Is there a limit to what we can do? Is there a boundary? Well, certainly there's some boundary out there. No one's going to go out and run the 100 meters in one second. No one's going to run the marathon in a minute and a half. But then where are those boundaries? Where are those limits? The fantastic thing is that nobody really knows. Because despite all expert claims, despite technological advances, despite all physiological studies, nobody has ever been sure or correct where records would be. They are not sure now, nor will they ever be sure. Because it's absolutely physically and philosophically inconceivable that if someone goes out and sets a record today, that another person is not going to come by the next day or the next year and be able to improve on that, even by an incremental amount. We are never going to hit perfection, and that's a fantastic thing because it gives us something to strive for. In terms of that something to strive for, going back to my story, um, that's what keeps me going as a coach. I'm no longer running anymore, so today I look forward to every day in, in this sport for the simple reason that I and our athletes can try to chase the fusive boundary of perfection together. Thank you.